Amen. Now do sit down and uh, open your Bibles and we're going to look uh, in the next part of our series, When Kingdoms Collide, Daniel chapter 10. Just a few weeks left now of this series. It's been great. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, God's got more to say today. Ch- Daniel chapter 10, Cheryl's going to come and read that for us. The words will be on the screen, but I encourage you, if you've got a Bible, to keep it there for when we go through it together. Strengthened by the glory of Jesus. Daniel's vision of a man. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belshazzar. It was a message, its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all during, until three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen, with a belt of finest gold round his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face, his face was like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and his legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice was like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with, who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deadly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. While he was saying this to me, I bowed my face towards the ground and was speechless. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I am helpless. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone, and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, O man, highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened, and I said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. So he said, Do you know why I've come to you? Soon I will return to the fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you about what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael your prince, and I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Great. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks very much. Okay, just keep your Bibles open there. 
But do you, could you, I wonder if you can remember a time when you experienced the fulfillment of something that seemed to be such a long process in, in happening, but it finally happened. It, you finally got there. You thought perhaps it might never come, right? Um, maybe it's that qualification that you worked really hard for, and then eventually you achieved it. Um, maybe it's um, slowly and patiently paying off a debt that once you'd done it, you just felt free. The burden was lifted off you. Or maybe it was like a holiday, holiday, a long time in the planning, or a visit to friends and family that you were so looking forward to and so long in the planning and just really enjoyed it when you got there. Just times, aren't there, of, of preparation and hoping for and longing for that seemed so long in the, in the distance, but finally they arrived. Well, the Jews um, were hoping and waiting for a return to their homeland, weren't they, after many, many years in exile in Babylon. That's what we've been looking at through this series. And last week, um, we, we, were, we saw that, that, that Daniel, as he read Jeremiah the prophet in the Bible, um, he learned that God had graciously promised them that the exile would just last for 70 years and then he would return them home again, back to Jerusalem. And Daniel as he was reading his scriptures, he turned it into prayer. It's really good for us to do that, isn't it? We read the Bible and we turn that into prayer. That's how we can pray uh, into God's will. But Daniel then, rather than being presumptuous in his prayer, rather than thinking, great, this is all going to happen and I'm just going to take it for granted. No, he was humble, wasn't he, in his prayers. He, he used his prayers to be confessing to God the sins of the nation. Um, and whilst he did that, then he called on God to be faithful to the promise that he had uh, made to the people to return them home. And God answered. God answered. We, uh, two years ago, we were looking at the book of Ezra. Seems a long time ago now. But let me read the first few verses of the first chapter of the book of Ezra. In the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus king of Persia, to make a proclamation. This is what he said. The Lord, the God of heaven, has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. And any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. Not only that, but if you remember some of the story, Cyrus gave them all the resources that they needed all the financial resources, all, the, all the, 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 the stuff that they would have needed to rebuild the temple. He just gave them everything. God initiated it. God moves hearts. God makes things happen. He keeps to his promises. But can you, can you just picture yourself amongst the people, God's people, when they heard the news that they could return home? Maybe some of them turned to Daniel and said, Daniel, can you believe it? After all this time, we can go back. It's really happening. We never thought, maybe we never thought it would happen within our lifetime. It's happening. Of course, Daniel could believe it. Do you remember last week, chapter 9 of Daniel? <laughs> he prayed. Gabriel appeared to him to tell him that God was going to fulfill this. So Daniel knew. Daniel had been praying and calling on the Lord. It just struck me this week. I don't know if you, you know, if you've ever stopped to reflect at times when God maybe has blessed you or done something in your life, whether it may have come about <laughs> by the prayers prayed by other Christians on your behalf that you may never, ever have known about. Can you imagine that? Christians are praying for you that you may never realize that they've been praying. And God is at work and doing something in your life and you may never, ever find those things out. But even with that thought planted in your mind, how might that cause you just to praise God that he's at work all the time in so many ways that we're unaware of, but even just thank him for other Christians who are praying for you. Whether you find out that, sometimes it's great, isn't it, to encourage people and tell them that you've been praying for them. Other times you'll never know. But you can turn to God and thank him this week and say, Lord, thank you for all those Christians that have been praying for me in my life and how you've worked through those prayers. Isn't that a good thing to start with as we reflect today? Now look, we come back to the story, and Ezra, in chapter 2, it tells us how many people in that first wave of exiles that returned back to Jerusalem, how many of them returned. It says that 42,360 men, women, and children went back in that first wave. 
They were hopeful, they were excited, they were expectant about what would happen as they returned home. But what we do know, because we see that we see uh, chapter 10 here of, of Daniel is a few years after that, we know that Daniel wasn't among that first group. So as they returned, maybe Daniel was there, watching them, waving them on their way, wishing them well, praying for them as they returned. But he wasn't in that first group. Now, chapter 10, we, we find ourselves in the third year, the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, verse 1 tells us. And news would have reached Daniel, uh, not, not too many years later, a couple of years later here, news would have reached Daniel about how the people of God were getting on back in Jerusalem. If you know some of that story, we know that it didn't take too long before there was opposition to the rebuilding of the temple and later on with Nehemiah, the city walls themselves. And Daniel would learn, hadn't he, in chapter 9, that there would be troubled times for God's people. The return back to Jerusalem would not be smooth. Troubled times would happen. Here, Daniel receives another revelation. Third year of King Cyrus, Daniel receives another revelation. In previous chapters of Daniel, it's been sort of quite neat that the, the visions or the revelations and then their interpretations have all sort of come uh, uh, and been embedded within one chapter of our English Bibles. But what we find with this final revelation is that it's spread across the last three chapters. So chapter 10, which is what we're looking at today, is sort of how the vision comes to Daniel. Chapter 11, in two weeks' time that Rob's going to bring us when he's back, hopefully he's back for that, um, is most of the content of that vision. And then chapter 12 is the conclusion of the vision and the conclusion of the book of Daniel. So it's split across those chapters. It's quite long. Today is more about how the revelation comes to Daniel. And what we're going to find Daniel doing and being encouraged by God to do is the same as what I think God wants us to do in response to what we're going to read today. And it's our two headings, right? The first one is to be awestruck by the holiness of Jesus. Daniel was, and God wants us to be as well, to be awestruck by the holiness of Jesus. But the second thing that God wanted Daniel to be, and I think he wants us to be in our times because of our lives in the future that we don't know, but God knows, is to be confident in the power of Jesus. Two so important things today. Let's have a look at it as we go through the story. To be awestruck by the holiness of Jesus. We're not, we're not told a great deal about the actual vision today. Verse 1 tells us that the vision was concerned a great war that was coming. The vision came to Daniel, tells us on the 24th, verse 4 says, the 24th day of the first month. So this would have been just over the Passover festival, which took place in the first month of the year. Um, and during Passover, as you know, the Jews would have abstained from having leaven in their bread. Yeah, They would have eaten unleavened bread. We don't know if during, their, during the exile they actually would have properly been able to celebrate the Passover with the, the whole of the meal and, and everything. But in any case, Daniel went further than the abstinence of just the leaven within the bread because we're, we're told here that in verse 3, he says, I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, no lotions uh, were used until the three weeks were over. What was Daniel doing here? It says he was mourning in some way. We saw that in, in the previous chapter, didn't, didn't we? Daniel, in his humble confession to God for the sin of the nation, he was in mourning continuation of that in some sense here. God, I think Daniel was seeking God more for more uh, knowledge of this revelation of the things that were to come. What, what, he wanted to know more of what God had for the people. Uh, of course, we, we heard last week about the 77s, uh, trying to understand a little bit of what that meant. But his 77s was talking about the completion of God's um, uh, rescue, his salvation plan for his people. Now, that included the return back to Jerusalem. It's part of God's plan, wasn't it? But we know that that wasn't the completion of it. God had a bigger plan for salvation, didn't he? A bigger plan for the salvation of the world. Just a return back to Jerusalem wouldn't do it. There was more to come as a revelation of the Messiah. And I wonder if Daniel, as he was intently seeking God and searching and asking God to reveal more, he just wanted to know God and God's ways more and more. Could Daniel be one of those that Peter writes about in the New Testament? In one of his letters, Peter talks about this salvation, 
that the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the times and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Now these prophets were great, greatly used by the Lord to bring the messages as God opened up more of his, his, his will for the world and his revelation of salvation. But they didn't know everything, did they? They didn't know all the details. Daniel couldn't have known exactly who Jesus was or when he was coming, but he was searching God and wanting to know. We're such a privileged, in such a privileged position, aren't we now? That we stand this side of the cross. We stand this side of Jesus' first coming. And we're just longing for Jesus' return. But we see salvation of God's plan in so much more detail than Daniel ever did. But Daniel here (laughs) also had a great experience because he was standing. He was standing here, as we see in this story, on the bank of the river Tigris, and a divine messenger appeared to him in response to his prayers. What it says uh, in verses 5 and 6, it says, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude. This was a stunning image of a glorious one from heaven. There were other Old Testament leaders who had special experiences with the divine Uh, special messages from God in order to pass on uh, these messages for the good of his people. We think of Isaiah. Remember Isaiah? He had that vision of the Lord sitting on his throne with seraphim flying above him, God's voice shaking the foundations, the temple filling with smoke. What was Isaiah's response to this vision? His response was, one, to praise God for his holiness, but also to despair at his own uncleanliness. When faced with the holiness of God, Isaiah realized how sinful he was. That's what happens, isn't it, when we see God for who he is, recognize him and we recognize who we are. Remember that that, um, vision of Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 1 of the image of the four living creatures, the loud voice of the almighty God, the throne shining like sapphire, the appearance of a man shining brightly like fire, like a, a rainbow on a Uh, a cloudy day and what could Ezekiel do in response to that vision all he could do was fall on his face when 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 in the presence of the mighty and the holy God we've been talking about pictures haven't we so many this this picture language of the prophetic and apocalyptic language and so it's quite hard to to picture them that's why people have painted things and can be quite helpful for us but Daniel too when, he, when he's in the presence of this holy one, this divine visitor, what does he do? It tells us, doesn't it, in verses 8 and 9, it says, I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. I heard him speaking and I listened to him and I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. <laughs> Daniel was just wiped out. It was just awesome. He was awestruck. What could he do? He had nothing left in him. It was only Daniel that saw the vision. No one else was left. Everyone else fled when they first sort of had the encounter. They just couldn't even handle it. They were filled with terror. So who was this man? Who was this visitor? There's debate about it. Some, some conclude that it was an angel sent as a divine messenger from God. But I want you to listen to another description from another experience, this time from John on the Isle of Patmos, Revelation chapter 1. Striking similarity to today's vision. Picture on the screen. I'm going to read the words from Revelation chapter 1. Someone like a son of man 
dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. Here's the line, yeah? You, you heard it already, didn't you? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I, I hold the keys to death and Hades. Who is this? This is the risen Lord Jesus, right? No mistaking, is it? This is Jesus with all authority in heaven and on earth given to him. Jesus in Revelation, he's pictured, isn't he, with a white, white robe and hair. It's his purity and perfection. This is Jesus with a golden sash, royalty and riches. This is Jesus with fire coming from him. You know, we thought about fire throughout Daniel, haven't we? Fire, the fire that brings, has the power to bring both judgment on sin, but the fire also to bring refinement and purification to those who are being saved. He had a voice like rushing waters, didn't he? Out of his mouth came a double-edged sword, authority in his words. You remember that in the book of Hebrews, that the word of God is like a double-edged sword. Jesus has the authority, has God's words. His face, like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. Phil Wickham takes his words from Scripture. This is the glory, the glory of Christ. And he proclaimed that because of his death, and his resurrection, he holds the keys to life and death. Jesus has all authority. He lives forever. He has eternity in his hands, and he has the power to bring us eternal life. Death has no hold on us anymore if we trust in Jesus, because the cross and his rising has won the victory. It's our call to you every time we preach to turn to Jesus. If you don't know him yet for your salvation, Jesus is the only one. Turn to him today. But as this pre, I believe this is a pre-incarnate uh, uh, vision of Jesus stand, standing before Daniel. And as he stood there with almost identical features to the Jesus who appears to John in Revelation, Daniel is awestruck by his holiness. Jesus' holiness just separates us from him in so many, so many ways. Jesus is the mighty one involved in the creation of the world. And we are dependent creatures. Jesus is completely perfect. And we are thoroughly flawed. Jesus has authority over all things. And we only have what he has given us. <laughs> he has conquered death and holds the keys to eternal life. We are subject to death unless he shows us mercy, which he has done in the cross. You know, we can, be, we can become, can't we, so familiar with Jesus. We can become so familiar with our salvation. If you've been a Christian a long time and you've heard the gospel message, you can become so familiar that we can, can the danger can be that we can become flippant, presumptuous, in our relationship with him. With this image of Daniel and his response to meeting Jesus and standing and falling on his face, be a reminder to us that Jesus is holy, pure, perfect, powerful, mighty, so great and above us. Yes, he, yes we can draw close to him and have confidence in approaching the throne of grace because of Jesus, but let's not become presumptuous. Let's remember the holiness of Jesus. And I just wonder... What might cause us to be awestruck by Jesus again? What might he do to open up and reveal more of himself to us, 
to grow our awe and wonder as to who he is. You may like music. Music, I love listening to music and listening to Christian music that just illustrates this. A couple of songs have been helpful to me with this in mind. It's, um, it's a band called, um, well, they've, they've, they've um, disbanded now, called Addison Road, American band, who, who did a song called What Do I Know of Holy? It sings all about this idea of God's holiness. And in one of the lines just says, I think I made you too small. I never feared you at all. And we can, can't we? We can make God too small, too familiar, too domesticated that we forget how great and mighty and holy he is. Maybe go and listen to that song. Matt Redman a few years ago wrote a song which was also the title track to his album Face Down. Again, singing about being in the presence of God and just being struck by him. I'll fall face down, he sings, as your glory shines around. Last week, I was encouraging you to reflect on the mercy of God. I want us to reflect on the holiness of God shown in Jesus Christ. and Be struck by him again. But as Daniel is struck by Jesus' holiness, Jesus also wants him and wants us to be confident in his power. From, from, from that point on, from sort of verse 10 onwards, there's this sort of discourse, this, this conversation that goes on between Jesus and Daniel to be confident, for Daniel to be confident in Jesus' power over all things, including the future that is to come. So whilst Daniel is in some ways fearful of what is to come, Jesus wants him just to be confident that he has everything in hand. Um, three times in this section, Jesus touches Daniel in order to strengthen him. Twice he tells Daniel that he is highly esteemed to, to reassure Daniel how much he's loved. Twice Dan, uh, Jesus tells Daniel not to be afraid because God is working for his good. He wants Daniel to have a peace despite the things that are to come. And I wonder in your life, I wonder when Jesus has drawn close to you or were you drawn close to him and experienced his touch, his intimacy, or experienced his voice speaking to you to reassure you of his power, his control, his love for you, so that you can have a greater confidence in him. When, when has he done that for you? Just reflect on that and be encouraged. D Daniel was weak, wasn't he here? He was weak, but Jesus was making him strong. Jesus brought him up from his face. Daniel was trembling still, on his hands and knees. And as Jesus speaks words of reassurance, he he stood Daniel up. Daniel was standing up, still trembling. But Jesus then pulls back the veil of the unseen world and he reveals to Daniel a spiritual battle that's going on behind the physical one. These are the words that he says in verses 12 and 13. He says to Daniel, Do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourselves before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. See, Jesus here talks about uh, the prince of the Persian kingdom. Who is this that he's referring to? I believe he's, he's talking about a demon, one of the devil's um, servants, working to help a nation opposed to God's rule. That's what we've been thinking about through Daniel, isn't it? Kingdoms against God's ruling kingdom. And then he refers also to Michael, one of the chief princes. Michael, an angel working on God's side, on God's behalf, described later in chapter 12 as the great prince who protects God's people. So you've got angels and demons battling and working for their masters as kingdoms collide. But God heard Daniel's prayers, didn't he? God heard Daniel's prayers and Jesus was coming to strengthen him. Jesus says, I was delayed. Jesus came on day one of the prayer, didn't he? But he was delayed 21 days because of this spiritual battle going on behind the scenes. I wonder to you whether that seems problematic, Jesus being delayed. Jesus is God, isn't he? He's God. How can he be delayed? Surely he's got control over all things. And uh, how can uh, enemies be resisting him. Uh, what's going on here? Why would Jesus need the help of an angel if he's God? Well, just think back to when Jesus was on earth. Do you remember a time that he was delayed? Arriving at Jairus' house. Jairus 
pleading with Jesus to come and heal his daughter who was dying, and Jesus was delayed. And Jesus, when he finally arrived at the house and he raised the daughter from death, it was Jesus revealing the glory and power of God in such a way that wouldn't have been as evident, it would have been still amazing to heal the daughter, but, but the glory was so much greater because of Jesus going through the process that he did to show God's power as he wanted to. Jesus uses, used all situations for God's glory. Do you remember also when um, angels attended Jesus after his trial in the wilderness? Um, an angel strengthened Jesus before his crucifixion. And when um, Jesus was arrested in the garden and his disciples tried to fight against the, the Roman soldiers, they just saw the physical battle, didn't they, going on. Jesus said, my father could call upon um, 12 legions of angels to protect me if he wanted me to, to, to resist this arrest. But Jesus knew that he had to die on the cross because it was the reason that he came. Salvation would come through the cross. So Jesus knows and Jesus entered into these situations. And I believe that it's well possible that an angel there was involved in helping Jesus in this battle as well. This is, of course, Jesus before all authority in heaven and on earth was given to him after his resurrection. But Jesus here, it says, had come to explain to Daniel what will happen to your people in the future. Daniel was still needing strength. He was, he was bowed, it says in verse 15, speechless. He was overcome with anguish, was weak. His strength was gone. He was struggling to breathe. But Jesus touched his lips, touched him again and gave him strength. Do not be afraid, Jesus said, you who are highly esteemed. Peace, be strong now, be strong. Just reminded me of the words in the New Testament where, which speaks to all of us as believers in, in one of, again, one of Paul's letters. When he was weak and troubled and grieving, we don't know the situation exactly, but the message from Jesus was this one. Very, very famous words and I'm sure has been a help to all of us. My, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power or my strength is made perfect in weakness. For Daniel, he was weak as anything. He had nothing left. But that's when Jesus could fill him. For us, where do we really know the power and the strength of Jesus? It's when we've got nothing left. And we need him and we rely on him for everything. Daniel was strengthened by Jesus, and he was ready to hear the message. Jesus said to him, do you know, do you know why I've come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. We've heard about these nations, haven't we? The Persian kingdom, the Greek empire that was coming. Jesus and his angels were at work, ready. It was now time to remove the Persian kingdom and allow the Greek empire to come into play because God was moving through history to accomplish his purposes even through these evil nations in many ways but he was working and weaving his plan throughout to make his plan known whatever happens in the physical world is underpinned by the spiritual unseen world that's taking place where God is at work and it underlines again, doesn't it, this, the, the theme and the title for this whole series is When Kingdoms Collide. And it emphasises again and again and again that when kingdoms collide, God wins every time. And he's not out of control now, is he? God wins every single time. You know, remember back in the days of Elisha, the prophet, where God sent this huge angelic army to, with, with chariots of fire to, to, to surround God's people. The Aramean army were, were ready to attack. And Elisha encouraged his, the servant there to open his eyes and God revealed this amazing army standing there on the hilltops. It took faith and it took a spiritual opening of eyes to see what God was doing. And it does for us too, doesn't it? We need to have our spiritual eyes open, not just to see the physical battle in front of us, but to see the spiritual one, where God is at work. 
even when we seem to see defeats, actually God is not defeated. We need to open our eyes and see that in the world around us. When we see the physical battles going on, we need to pray for the spiritual battle that's going on in the Ukraine at the moment. Did you hear the story this, this last week or two of this figure here, um, Grigory um, Alfeyev, is one of the senior leaders within the Russian Orthodox Church, one of the very few high up in the Russian Orthodox Church that's spoken out against the war. And what's happened to him? He's been removed from his position. Moved to Budapest, away from human influence, because there's an enemy who wants to be in control of this battle. But God is in control of this battle. Pray for the spiritual battle that's taking place in that country. Let's pray, pray for the spiritual values that are influencing leadership in Sudan. I was reading in this last week, a group of Christians recently tortured for not renouncing their faith. It's happening in lots of countries at the moment. Lots of persecution. But there's a spiritual battle that's underpinning any leadership that resists God. Pray when we think of actually what something that, amazing that we can see that God has been doing. I read this story this week. Um, an amazing, amazing conversion to Christ of um, this man, Rian Swigelar. Found, he was a founder or co-founder of a South African satanic church. And recently, just in this last couple of weeks, um, after meeting with a Christian, um, he went away, performed a satanic ritual, and during that ritual... Who met him? Jesus Christ met him, revealed himself to him, and this man felt the unconditional love of Jesus Christ and was transformed. He was blown away. He's come to Christ. And this spiritual battle for souls that is taking place in the world, Jesus is changing people. Pray for it more and more. Pray for that battle for souls of people's lives that you know that haven't turned to Jesus yet. We know that there's a spiritual battle behind the, behind the physical one. And in the New Testament, Paul urges Christians, and we are urged to put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Each element of that armour, go back and read it maybe this week. We'll meet to pray and discuss it. Now, each element of that armour protects us from the devil who doesn't want to just harm us physically, but the devil wants to pull us away. He wants to make us doubt our salvation. He wants to pull us away from the love of God. He wants us to, to leave our faith behind. And distrust the God who says that he loves us, but the devil wants us to reject it. I wonder how you've prayed for God's protection in your life, to protect you from the devil's schemes and experienced his, his faithfulness to you in a storm. I've, I've had lots of times in my life where I'm sure that God has even sent angels to protect me physically, spiritually, in times when I've struggled or, or times of danger. I've certainly felt it. Maybe you can recount times too. Have your eyes open to what God is doing spiritually beyond just what you see physically. Jesus is about to tell Daniel as he finishes, we finish chapter 10 today. He's about to tell Daniel what is written in the book of truth. It's what's coming in chapter 11. But here's the thing. This book of truth, the book, life, Jesus holds it. Jesus holds the truth about life, history, the future. It's all in his hands. Our confidence is in the power of Jesus. And so today I just want us to do those two things that Daniel did. Just today. We'll finish in a minute, don't we? But this week, to be awestruck again by the holiness of Jesus. Not so familiar, so pre presumptuous, but be humble and worshipful of our King and our Saviour. And confident in the power of Jesus that rather than being fearful of the kingdoms of this world, that we would be confident that the kingdom God is establishing through Christ is the one that will last forever. So let's pray to that end.
Lord Jesus, we are struck again by your glory. You're so different, God, to us. Your holiness, your purity, your perfection, your power, your greatness. And we are small and we're weak. We're sinful. We're limited. But we're so grateful that in you, Lord Jesus, we have our salvation. You've come close to us. You've given your life to us, not because we deserved it, but because of your great grace and your love. Thank you. Thank you that we are yours. Help us. If anyone hasn't turned to Christ, help, help us to respond to you today. But help us too to have a confidence in Jesus that when all we see around us seems chaos, Jesus holds all things and knows all things and has a plan for all things. Help us to trust you more and more. Help us to encourage those who are struggling within our church, those that are not here, those that haven't been for weeks. Help us to look out for them, to be in touch with them, to pray for them. Thank you that you use the prayers of your people to bless each other in our lives. Help us to be a prayerful people, relying on the grace of God. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.